we're going to start, I think, now because uh, we've got a lot to get through. So, um, welcome. I'm so excited, or we are so excited, for our second webinar of the Gender Deviance and Society Research Group. And we decided to mark uh, the publication of a textbook, which you can see on the screen, uh, which involves uh, many of the leaders and associate members of the group. The textbook is Sex and Crime, and the book came out in January 2021, so fresh, hot off the press. The driving force behind the book is Dr. Alex Van Hannel, who is going to tell you a bit more about the inspiration for the book and the under, underpinnings of it in a moment. Uh, I just wanted to let you all know as well that the seminar is being recorded because apparently we have a new YouTube channel, so that's cool. Um, and yeah, uh, if you want to buy the book, here's a discount code. Yay. So obviously, I'm, trying, I'm doing a RuPaul here. Uh, I, we haven't really told you enough about the book to convince you to buy it yet, but maybe by the end you'll be sold. And uh, yeah. Before we move between the sheets, let's go around and introduce ourselves. And I'm gonna start. I'm Juliet Zampini. I'm a senior lecturer in criminology at the University of Greenwich. And I am also a co-author of the Sex and Crime book. Hi, I'm Stacey Banwell. I'm a principal lecturer at the University of Greenwich. And I'm also a co-author of the uh, book, Sex and Crime. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dr Michael Fiddler, I'm an Associate Professor of Criminology at the University of Greenwich and uh, yeah, I've also got the pleasure of being a co-author. Hi, I'm Emma Milne, Assistant Professor in Criminal Law and Criminal Justice at Durham University and funnily enough also a co-author of the book. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm um, Alex Spanghanol, a Senior Lecturer in Criminology and uh, I'm also a co-author of this book. And so um, to get the ball rolling, I thought we, we thought what we would do is we would start by telling, uh, talking a little bit about um, why we came to write this book and what we wanted to do with it to kind of situate it in the, um, to kind of give a sense of what it was we were trying to achieve uh, in terms of um, creating a text which uh, offers almost, I suppose, kind of like uh, quite unique and um, innovative ways of thinking about age old problems of the relationship between sex and crime. So um, we wanted to create this book um, to, uh, to explore expansively the different ways that the criminal justice system interacts with sexuality, sexual practice and desire. And we wanted to do that, but not just by simply looking at crime, but also by looking at deviance and elements of sexuality that are policed outside of the straightforward criminal justice system instruments like uh, the courts, the police, the prisons and so on. So we wanted to um, have a kind of holistic look at the question of sex and the way in which it interacts with issues of criminality um, and criminology more broadly. And we decided that we would try to achieve that using a um, feminist, queer, anti-colonial uh, epistemological approach. And so uh, that's evidenced in the um, way in which we approached the writing of the book. So we did, we approached it in a very collaborative way um, and we have adopted throughout the text um, a position which critiques dominant narratives um, about sexuality um, and particularly around sexual practice and the way in which it interacts with um, the law and, and uh, the criminal justice system. Um, we also wanted to try, as well as critiquing dominant narratives, which uh, we do throughout the, each of the chapters of the book, to try and imagine a different future. And so uh, we try, we've tried towards the end of the book to think of ways to um, imagine different radical possibilities for sexuality um, and for the way in which it interacts with the world. And so the pedagogical underpinnings of this um, are rooted within a um, what we would call a critical, radical, emancipatory approach to knowledge and knowledge production. And so here we've been really inspired by the work of Paulo Freire, uh, Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde as um, uh, key thinkers who not only come up with um, inspirational ways in which to uh, think about knowledge and how we know things and how, what we do with this knowledge, but also put that into practice in the classroom. So we've really tried to create something which um, translates from um, uh, knowledge within a book that you can use 
um, in real life in what uh, Freire would call the creation of a praxis, the, the capacity to act and to do things. And so we've done this through um, uh, kind of encouraging the reader to uh, see the world from a critical perspective and also to think about injustice more broadly and what to do when they encounter injustice, whatever that injustice looks like and what of whatever form that injustice takes, taking a critical perspective again about what justice might look like in the first place. So we do this through using thought provoking exercises, some of which you're going to experience later on, and um, by creating um, eclectic reading lists which are interdisciplinary and which draw on different voices from around the globe and, att and to try attempt to incorporate transnational views on the issue of sexuality and sexual practice. Uh, through challenging, probing questions and challenging subject matters actually within the book. So um, uh, it's 15 chapters long. Um, our final chapter is rather humbly called uh, How to Change Your Life, Love, Hope, Anger and Other Unlikely Revolutionaries. And it's in that that we sort of set out kind of pathways that you might explore to take the learning that you encounter within the book out into the world and out into the um, the the, um, the 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 lived experience that you encounter that's beyond the classroom. So that's what we were trying to do. Um, have we got a slide of today's themes that we're going to be talking about today, Julia? Yes. Uh, this is just to give you a flavour. As Alex said, it's fifteen chapters, so we couldn't fit it all in. Uh, and we um, we try to unpack some of the central themes and issues. Uh, primarily uh, focusing on consent and also asking the question, why is the state in my bedroom? And uh, as Alex mentioned, the session will be very interactive. So be prepared to do some thinking and clicking. You can use the Q&A function in Zoom and also feel free to interact and comment in the chat. Uh, although please try to use the Q&A function for questions to make it easier for us to uh, respond and interact with you through that, uh, through the questions. So we've got uh, reflection based exercises and case studies from the book that we're going to kind of discuss between us. And um, yeah, uh, towards the end, there will be opportunities to maybe for you to ask questions about the bits that were too hot to show. And yeah, um, I think that's it. Let, let's start at the beginning, uh, which is one of the very first things that we encounter in the book, uh, and that is Gail Rubin's wheel. So Alex, tell us more about that. Yeah, okay, so uh, to get things started, we start off the book. Uh, one of the first things we talk about in the book is, a ch is uh, uh, Gail Rubin's concept of the charmed circle. And so uh, this, this concept, you can see it here on your screen if you um, are able to, uh, as I'll explain, come on to explain in a second, to um, look at this on your device, you can click on the image to have a closer look at what goes on in her circle. But basically, um, the, uh, the charm circle um, is a concept developed by Gail Rubin, who was, uh, to situate her in her context, um, San Franciscan based, lesbian, leather, um, uh, sadomasochist um, scene participant, who was writing about uh, in her essay called Thinking Sex, writing about the uh, ways in which good sex and bad sex are um, constructed by all sorts of different instruments which kind of nudge people into having like, good appropriate sex and uh, kind of demonize and pathologize people who are on the outer limits of her charmed circle and who are um, not, who, who are having sex which is considered to be for, for forbidden or otherwise completely deviant. So if you have a look at the uh, charm circle, oh, how long we've gone, yeah, all right. I was gonna talk a bit more about it, thank you. If you have a look at the charm circle, you can see on the outside um, that the, um, uh, the sorts of uh, outer limit sex that are banned or kind of considered to be deviant or, or, or non-normative, according to Rubin, uh, is homosexual sex, sex which is unmarried, which is promiscuous, which is non procreative, sex which is commercial, which basically means for money, paid sex, sex which happens alone or in a group, sex which is casual, as sex which is cross-generational, and to be clear that means uh, between different people of significantly different ages, it's kind of euphemistically used to describe paedophilia, sex which happens in public, sex which we use as pornography, um, or sex which happens with objects involved. 
uh, sex which is say or say sex which is sadomasochistic. So this is the outer limits of what she considers to be acceptable sexual practice. Um, on the inner charm circle, the good sex that the state wants you to have is heterosexual, married, monogamous, non-commercial, in pairs, not one, not more, uh, in a relationship with somebody of the same age as you, in your house, without pornography, using only your bodies and no other objects, no sex toys, and what she would call vanilla, i.e. non-sadomasochistic um, or using bondage. So she, this is the, um, uh, the framework that she um, establishes to say that basically the state facilitates certain sorts of sexual practice which are legitimate and ones which are designated as problematic and other. So um, the um, approach that she takes is one which is critical of the sex negativity that she sees everywhere in the world and which um, kind of tries to promote sex positivity, which is kind of making a place for this outer limit type of sex to be enabled to happen to be legitimate in the world. So um, what I would like you to do if we switch to the next slide is to, this is where it gets interactive. So we are gonna ask you to, um, to answer some of these questions using your devices. So we, the, pro, the, the system we use for this is called Mentimeter. And Mentimeter is basically like a quizzing thing. So it's very simple. All you need to do using your device, your tablet, another tab on your screen in front of you, um, your phone most commonly, is to go to the website menti.com and to put the, um, uh, the code, which I think is the code going into the chat as well, um, into the, um, when you're asked to input the code. And using Mentimeter, you're able to follow the, the, the presentation on your device, of course. But actually, we're going to be asking you some questions. So um, have a go and tell us what you think here. The question that we're asking you to think, bearing in mind that this uh, wheel of good and bad sex was created in 1984. Tell us how important do you think that the following categories still are for sex to be considered uh, appropriate? So how important is it important for sex to be um, heterosexual, to be in the context of marriage, to be procreative, to be just with one other person, to be someone of the same ages as you, like within the same generation, uh, to be done in private, so not in the garden or in the park, uh, to be done without pornography or to occur just with bodies and not sex toys, I think, or other sorts of um, implements. So I'm going to give you all a chance to respond we've got seven questions seven responses in already it's perfect very good you'll see there's 40 people in the chat so in the chat in the seminar which is wonderful i'm going to wait a little moment to see if uh, we get any more advances on that we can see that um even though the um wheel was created in 1984 there's still some there's still some tendencies towards thinking that some of these might still be important, although there's much more of a sense of perhaps, um, I guess, uh, a, a more liberal sex positive perspective that Rubin would probably have been delighted by, seeing that um, there seems to be quite, at the moment, a sway towards people agreeing that you don't need to be married or procreative or... Um, using pornography in order or not using pornography in order to have what might be considered by the state to be good sex that's great still seeing that obvious that we're still seeing i'm going to say obviously but i don't mean obviously that um monogamy is considered still considered to be um an important thing in sexual practice that sex between people of the similar ages is still valued by the state as an important thing and that it's something uh, far and ahead on that, by a margin really, is that sex should be happening in private. How do you get in? So how do you get into it? So basically um, you need to um, uh, use your device, any device, um, phone, tablet, another tab on your computer. The website is menti.com and then you'll be uh, pro pro um, promote, provoked, provoked into paying a code. And the code is there, 79515576 and you should be able to participate. Um, I'm going to uh, wait, maybe another, yeah, I think that we've got a good proportion of people who've participated. So we can see that whatever um, Rubin was thinking as being a significant um, 
uh, as, what, whatever, however Rubin had figured the concept of the, uh, the uh, significance of the charm circle, maybe now, so many years later, we have shifted a little bit from, our, uh, from what we might consider to be, understand as being mainstream and normative within um, contemporary sexual practice, apart from, as we can see, along the lines of um, monogamy, generation, intergenerational sex and privacy. So that's quite interesting. Let's move on to the next question. Tell us, which elements of the charm circle would you take away? Which do we not need anymore? Which ones are um, no longer necessary for um, sexual practice to be considered to be good sex? Again, as ever, it's completely anonymous when you're contributing. So we won't know what you, what, who is thinking what they're thinking. Got some great starting um, votes, brilliant stuff. Oh, Evely, don't be sad. We have to use Menti all the time now, but we found a way to enjoy it. <laughs> okay, which elements of the circle would you remove? Uh, so we've got 21 voters, let's see. Interestingly, so again, I guess this, rec this echoes the side that you, we saw before that um, uh, the, the importance of procreative sex is less considered to be less important. Um, the uh, absence of pornography is considered to be less important. It's interesting that we've still got some my, some some people voting for removing the um, intergeneration for removing the the, in, the invective against intergenerational sex. That's interesting. Um, uh, but yes, we can see that there are some the one which is the most the ones which are the most popular then are married sex and procreative sex and heterosexual sex. So I think that that's uh, kind of and, and closely followed by uh, pornography. And I think that that really demonstrates a kind of shift in normative um, framings of sexual practice. So um, uh, I think it demonstrates perhaps how um, what we think of as being good and a good sex has, has kind of has perhaps shifted. The question we have to ask ourselves is whether the state agrees. Um, is, are we up to the next slide? So this is up to you. Go freestyle. Tell us, what would you add to the charm circle? What's, what now is important, considered to be it's, it's an important element of good sex, that the state, that um, uh, society values, that people think is, of as being um, uh, a desirable thing when it comes to sex, that perhaps isn't in the um, uh, charm circle? Absolutely, consent, great stuff, great start. Pleasure with humans, yes, so that's a very important point. That's absolutely not um, uh, uh, mentioned within her, even within the outer limits. Um, pleasure, consent, no constraints, in with love, with fun. I think it's really, it's a really uh, um, good point that in the um, dividing up between good and bad sex, there's no mention really of desire. And I think that you guys who are contributing have identified that there is this element of desire, fun, love, um, uh, and um, uh, pleasure that is missing perhaps from the other elements of the charm circle. Mm -hmm. And uh, in particular, you've, most of you have noted that consensual sex is now something that people are, that much more emphasis is put on, which is good, because we're gonna come onto that in a second. Um, and um, other elements like safety, non -se anti-sexism, I guess, non-sexism, um, pleasure for everybody, uh, respect, safety. So there's kind of a different kind of way of maybe almost a philosophy of thinking about sex, which is different, which has shifted a bit in contemporary times. So I think there's some really great um, uh, observations there. The ones which are the biggest ones are the ones which most of you have gone for. So that's why they're bigger. But um, it kind of gives you a sense of the uh, um, things that we perhaps now in our contemporary socio-cultural context here and now value or consider to be important within good sexual practice and that seems to be a shift from kind of like following the rules and being like a good citizen in this context of marriage and reproduction and monogamy towards something which is um, playful, desirable, consensual, healthy, can, taking into consideration of people's mental health um, somebody has also put not paid for or compelled, and we think that's a, maybe a discussion point we can have later, um, uh, with desire, with fun. 
without constraint with a sense of good body image so I think that there's some really interesting shifts there that you've identified so I'm what obviously the biggest one that you've identified is the consent and I think that that's very appropriate uh, because um, the um, next part of the discussion that we want to move on to is one which gives a little bit more which delves down a bit more into this question of consent and so with that I'm going to ask Emma to tell us a little bit more. Helps if you come off mute. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so one of the key themes that runs throughout the book and we touch on through multiple chapters is this idea of consent and what does it mean to consent to sexual activity? So we explore this in detail in chapter four where we outline the concept of consent, the uh, issues and the, the elements of it that are used to define whether or not consent is present. And they are having choice, the freedom to choose, having capacity to make that choice and having enough information to make that choice. So what we do in the first chapter in chapter four is we unpack each of those issues and we think about how easy are they to express, to respond to, uh, how well do people understand them and employ them when they're engaged in sexual activity. To give you a taste of the activity in this chapter, we have three scenarios for you to consider. We want you to think about whether or not there is consent in these situations. We're not asking you whether or not they are legally a sexual offence or legally if they are rape. We're simply asking you, do you think there is consent here? So vote now for each of them, please. Only one person so far. <laughs> Come on, people, be brave. Okay, interesting. Eight people and still we think there is no, oh, okay. We've got some, some potential votes for consent going on here. Right. So each of these scenarios, I'll just talk a little while you are having a chance to vote. Each of these scenarios, are falling around um, the element of uh, knowledge that one person would have or maybe both people would have in relation to the sexual activity and whether the knowledge that they have is sufficient. Um, so we can see everybody, uh, we've had what, 29 votes so far and the leaning is very close towards no, there is no consent in these situations. So our analysis of them that we talk about in the book essentially would say that in each of these scenarios, there is effectively no consent, that the, they all lack information. Um, in some of the cases, such as in Craig's, there's, there's clearly active deceit taking place where a condom is being actively removed. Um, in others, uh, so same with Alex and Kit's situation where there's a lie taking place. The first scenario, you could potentially see that as maybe it's mistaken information, but nevertheless, there is a lack of information, we would argue, in order for consent to be considered to be legitimate. One of the things we do in this chapter is we finish by problematizing the issue of consent and saying, okay, so not only are there, there are problems and difficulties in terms of understanding um, what capacity means or what having enough information means or what having the freedom to choose means. But actually, when we look at the structures that take place within society, particularly structures between men and women, and this is something that second wave feminists particularly picked up and talked about, actually the issues around consent become incredibly problematic. So as McKinnon argued, men fuck, women get fucked. The hierarchies within heterosexual relationships promote the idea that women are there simply as objects for men to have sex with, whereas men uh, have this right and this ability to uh, fulfill their sexual desires regardless of uh, what the, their partner wants. And feminists uh, have identified that these ideas around um, sexual consent and notions of when people can and should be able to have sex with other people very much rely on um, sexual scripts, heterosexual scripts and social expectations. So the main um, element that we can we conclude from this chapter is that consent in and of itself is potentially not enough because you could in fact consent to something while not wanting it. And in this aspect, the law in and of itself in England and Wales certainly is, is really rather problematic because it is 
based on the principle of consent, which means that if one partner actively consents to it, even if they don't in fact want to have sex, then um, no law has been broken, no, there's no sexual offending going on, um, and consent is considered legally to be present. So one of the things we talk about throughout the book is when we talk about consent, we don't simply talk about consent, we talk about sex needing to be both consensual as well as wanted. And the wanted is really important for that aspect. Which takes us into our next case study, which we discuss in the book. So in this context, I'm, so here we're gonna like um, expose a story which maybe some of you are familiar with, Maybe not. And we're going to ask you what you think. But first of all, we're going to kind of unpack it between ourselves and get down with the uh, the uh, details of this unusual case. So some of you may be, may be familiar with this case. It's the case of Gail Newland, who was in 2011 a marketing and creative writing student um, at the University of Chester. And she met, a, uh, <clears throat> she met a girl called Chloe in a queer club night uh, in Chester. And the two became friends. Um, for a long time before she came to university, Newland had used a male alter ego on, to flirt with women online. And she, she called this alter ego Kai Fortune. And she would pose as Kai online to experiment with like a masculine identity, to flirt with women and to help them to pursue women. So having met each other at this queer night, uh, New Gail Newland told Chloe that she that Kai was her friend and that he, Kai, was attracted to Chloe. And so they became friends on Facebook, Chloe and Kai. And so Chloe and Kai started to date each other um, and their relationship was mediated by Newland, who was like their go-between and sent messages between them and dealt with them when they had problems or fights. And so Chloe said that she believed that um, Newland was a mutual friend of hers and Kai's. Yet from Newland's perspective, the online persona of Kai Fortune that she had created gave both an alibi for a love affair in a context in which they were both unsure about being out as women who have sex with women. So in order to pull it off, what Newland and Chloe did uh, was to have sex with each other, where Newland as the boy Kai would tie up Chloe's hands behind her back and make her wear a blindfold, telling her that they um, had that Kai had had this very um, traumatic accident and needed to wear, sorry, <clears throat> and needed to wear like a chest pump in order to keep his heart beating and had been very severely scarred in this accident, so he couldn't be seen. So she, so Chloe is always wearing this this her hands tied so she can't touch the chest and her eyes blindfolded. And um, so uh, for two years, Chloe and Kai had sex with each other in this fashion, blindfolded and tied up so she, that Chloe couldn't touch him. Um, on one occasion, something provoked Chloe to take off this blindfold. And there she discovered that it was actually her friend, Gail Newman, Gulland, who was penetrating her with a dildo and not a penis as she had believed. So they had an argument, they sent um, nasty messages to each other. Uh, Gail Newland tried to throw, kill herself by throwing herself off a bridge. Ultimately, she was tried and sent to prison for six years and six months on three counts of sexual assault and one of fraud. So this fraud is one that takes place in the offline world, basically, like they in in uh, their in the bedrooms of the of the women. But it was facilitated by uh, the <clears throat> anonymity and the potentiality offered by the digital realm. And so one of the things that we um, found interesting when we decided to talk about this case, because in the book we talk about it in the context of um, romance fraud and digital sex, actually, um, was the way in which it brought in the question of something like gender fraud. And what I thought was interesting, and we'll hear from everybody else about what they thought was interesting, is the way, the implications that this case has for trans rights and the suitability of the criminal justice system to deal with these sorts of cases. And specifically, the limits of the rules around consent. So um, let's uh, see, should we go to the next slide to see what you guys think about this? What do you think? So they've, uh, they're in bed together, She's blindfolded and bound by the hand so as not to touch Kai's body. Has Chloe consented to have sex here? It's running away with no. Chloe has not consented to have sex here. Why? Because as we know from what Emma's just told us, she hasn't got the information. She's, had, she's consented to have sex with Kai, a boy. She's having sex with... Chloe, who's, who's a girl. 
<coughs> in this context and whom she considers to actually be her friend and not her lover. Okay. And after that, oh, let's just wait for the, the last uh, ones to come in. Yeah. Some people unsure. I think that's important uh, to be unsure. And also, I, I, I think that the uh, it will be interesting if we've got time at the end to um, go, go, come back to this question about um, whether or not consent was had here. Let's have the next one. Has Chloe had sex here? She's penetrated by a dildo after all. So. Hmm. So what, once again, running away with the yes, you did have sex because um, you're all rec recognizing that sex doesn't have to involve a penis or indeed um, uh, penetration. For the purposes of, for, <clears throat> from the purposes of the law in England and Wales, Chloe has not been raped in this scenario because a penis is not present in the sexual encounter that they've had. So um, it starts to show us the limits of um, what the criminal justice system will do, can do when it comes to this sort of um, potential crime, if indeed you agree that a crime was ha was, was, had occurred here in the first place. So um, let's see then if I, so I, I've already sort of, I've already set out how what I found most interesting about this case, this idea that it kind of, that it opens up the possibility for, well, rather it demonstrates the way in which the criminal justice system is perhaps not set up for dealing with um, uh, the um, uh, issues around um, trans rights and trans people's um, in sexual encounters, including the way in which these two women have completely different stories about the truth of what happened between them. Um, I th and so um, I think that when it comes to thinking about the limits of the law around consent um, and the importance of deception about knowing um, uh, who it is that you're having sex with and how important that is to your consent, um, we start to see almost the edges of what the law is able to do here. Uh, Stacey, what do you think? Um, so this case reminded me of um, Henry and Powell's article in called um, Embodied Harms, Gender Sa Shame and Technology Facilitated Sexual Violence. I think their notion of technology facilitated sexual violence is useful here, because as Alex explained, the case involved uh, fraud in the online, but also in the real world, culminating in uh, sexual assault. And I think the case asks us to think about the differences between uh, real world harms and virtual harms, with some people arguing that they are not comparable. What I found interesting in the article is that the authors talk about um, injury, shame, and how they are perpetrated and experienced and performed and defined. But in their article, they do so in relation to masculinity. Indeed, in their article, there's this kind of implicit assumption that the perpetrators of technology facilitated sexual violence are male. So for me, this case, uh, similar to what Alex was saying, reminds us of the complexity of gender identities and sexualities when we're thinking about crime, uh, victimization and the criminal justice system. Okay, so I think for me, the, the, the point of interest comes uh, in terms of the media representation. So if we think about the ways in which uh, this case was phrased in that opening slide uh, that had kind of like headlines from the, the Sun and the, the Mail and the Guardian, it, it's shocking the extent to which uh, it fits in with Mike Presdy's idea of the press being both scandalized and scandalizing. Um, you kind of have this uh, salacious language applied to this, this complex, um, this complex case. It's kind of going back, I mean, the, the trial, the second trial kind of happened just a couple of years ago, but the case itself goes back about, I think, 10 years. And I think to use a, a bit of an expression from perhaps right wing political literature, uh, the Overton window on, on trans rights issues has, has shifted, particularly online. And I'd be curious if, if a similar kind of case happened now, what the kind of online discussion would be. I mean, ordinarily, we wouldn't necessarily think about social media being a place of uh, kindness and empathy. Um, but perhaps perhaps this particular issue, this particular case would be seen in a, in a slightly different way. Um, yeah, Julia, I'll, I'll hand over to you. 
Yeah, I was, that's a really good point, Michael. I was thinking about how different it would be, like how much things have changed in the debate about uh, trans rights and gender dysphoria uh, in terms of being in the public domain, uh, much more than it used to be back in 2010, 2011 when the case went down. And yeah, to be honest, I, I was saying this yesterday, this case just made me really sad. I was intensely sad and kind of empathizing with Gil Newland because uh, I felt as though so much of uh, kind of gender essentialism is, and heteronormativity is placed upon people to the point where they feel like they can't escape a particular way of relating and they can never be successful uh, in their gender and or in their in their expression of sexual and romantic feelings for other people and so I just yeah I was just really very sad and I didn't couldn't kind of overcome couldn't yeah couldn't overcome that feeling of sadness to think about you know crime or even you know or even the violence that happened and deceit like that wasn't the main thing for me yeah So if we perhaps move on to think about the sentence that was given out in this case. So Gail was um, sentenced for six years uh, imprisonment for this. We'd like you to kind of think about what we've talked about the case and decide what do you think about uh, the level of sentence that she received for her actions. So bear in mind when you're when you're um, voting, she was convicted of assault by penetration. Assault by penetration falls under section two of the Sexual Offences Act 2003. It does have a maximum of life imprisonment and it has been designed as an offence to be considered to be as serious as rape, but acknowledging that not all penetration would take place using a penis. It could take place, for example, using a dildo or using a broken bottle or a finger or a knife, for example. So, I mean, we're seeing now a real mixed bag between longer, shorter and no change. <laughs> so not sure we can draw much of a conclusion here because, uh, well, no change, I suppose, is just pulling ahead. Perhaps something to just, as you're finishing off voting there, to also think about in relation to the sentence that Gail received. What, one of the things we did in preparation for this talk was we attempted to find out what the average rape sentence was. Um, so this is information I actually couldn't find out, um, which is usually an indication that it's something that the government simply don't want you to know. Um, they do tend to be very good at hiding and obscuring data that they find quite embarrassing. So the last bit of information I could find was from 2011, which was a Guardian newspaper article, and that talked about how the average was now eight years for rape. So um, we can see in this instance, uh, Gail is receiving just slightly below what the average was in 2011. I'd be willing to put money on the fact that the average is actually lower now. And in fact, I do have some horrendous statistics around sentencing for rape. So in 2017, of the 1,130 convictions that uh, were handed out, eight of them involved a suspended sentence, 70 of them involved a community sentence, three of them involved an absolute discharge, which I just find absolutely unbelievable. Almost a hundred, uh, well, it involves a penis, so it would be men, a hundred men who have been convicted of rape did not end up going to prison for what they did, which is just, I mean, I, I always find that quite shocking when I'm teaching that to my students. So if we, if we just think a little bit further about um, the consent in this case and, and Gail's uh, behavior and why Gail's behavior potentially did vitiate consent. What is really, I think, quite striking about this case is that um, the, the courts were very quick to say that yes, um, consent was no longer valid because there was deception in place. However, they've also been, um, the, the Court of Appeal has also um, put together other judgments where there has also been deceit involved and yet they have concluded that in fact, it didn't vitiate consent, even including uh, in the case of Lawrence in 2020, where the man had, had had told the woman he was having sex with that he'd had a vasectomy and therefore she couldn't get pregnant. As a result of that, she agreed that she would not use a condom. She then became pregnant because he had in fact lied. 
um, and she uh, um, asked for a prosecution of rape to take place. The Court of Appeal in ruling on this case argued that his lie about not being fertile, or rather being fertile when he said he was not, um, did not in fact vitiate consent, as it's only such a uh, deception of the risk and consequences of sex, not the physical performance of the sexual activity, um, which, which invalidates care consent. So um, because he'd lied purely about the fact that he could get her pregnant, that was considered to be the risks and consequences of, cons uh, of sex. It wasn't considered to be the physical performance. Whereas in the case uh, of Gail, it was the physical performance element and therefore it was considered to, to negate consent. So these challenging discussions around how the courts have understood and interpreted consent and what does and does not invalidate consent is something we're going to see throughout the book. So yeah, why is the state in my bedroom? Why? <laughs> Basically, uh, in the book, we, um, we put a lot of emphasis on heteronormativity. And we talk about how heteronormativity is embedded within the state and the agencies of the state, including the criminal justice system. So we discuss um, how these agencies of the state, they shape the regulation of sex and sexuality, and they also intervene upon non-normative sexual conducts. For example, homosexual group sex, BDSM, chemsex, these are some of the cases that uh, we focus on in chapter nine. But also um, things that perhaps we would maybe not expect um, to, to, to be want to want to regulate as much. So more heteronormative activities like reproduction, like pregnancy, and of course abortion, uh, which are the subject of chapter six of the book. Yes, oh, you are so mistaken if you think the state does not want to regulate pregnancy and reproduction. It's one of their favorite things to regulate. Uh, so chapter six, as uh, Julia said, focuses on how the state regulates pregnancy. And we, we particularly talk about who and when can a woman become pregnant and who and when can a woman have an abortion. And what we mean by that is the state gets very antsy about certain groups of people becoming pregnant. So, for example, disabled women, um, women who are young. We, we are constantly seeing headlines about how horrendous it is that there's all these teenage pregnancies going on. Um, we're, the the um, state also and the media in particular also gets very unhappy when older women get pregnant. You see um, the term that is constantly being used of a geriatric pregnancy. And I think the age at which geriatric pregnancy now starts being used is something like 38 or something like that so it's quite horrifyingly young 35 35 oh it's even worse than I thought okay so um we and then we see similar ideas around abortion so who is it's considered legitimate can have an abortion uh and I, I'll talk a little bit more about how the abortion law in the in uh Britain is framed shortly but essentially it's almost sensed as if women need a really, really good reason to have an abortion. We're gonna think about that a little bit more in a moment. So the chapter focuses on the rights and freedoms of women in relation to their reproductive health, their reproductive rights, but also their access to medical care in relation to uh, preventing a pregnancy, which would include an abortion, but also in terms of continuing a pregnancy. And as part of that, we look at the rise and growth we've seen in fetal rights and laws that aim to protect fetuses. So this research is predominantly looking at the, you know, uh, the USA, but also uh, incorporating my own research is also looking at what's taking place in the UK and the ways in which our criminal laws are being used to regulate women if they're deemed to be harming the fetus. So one of the activities in the chapter uh, is to get the reader to think about when would an abortion be considered acceptable for them. And we provide them with a whole host of scenarios and um, a whole host of different elements to those scenarios to have them think about it. So the aim of this, uh, this activity is to, to start to get them to problematize the concept of having an abortion. So we provided you with a small number of these scenarios, and we'd like you to consider whether or not you think an abortion is acceptable in these situations. And it's down to your personal opinion what you think. So please, please do vote now. Uh, 
nobody is voting. Is that because you can't see it? Ah, one person. Okay. I'm glad it's working. So you perhaps can tell we might, we've potentially chosen some, some rather uh, provocative examples, um, which including you can uh, imagine that as I was drafting this chapter and I was sending it round, the, the, I was getting suggestions for more and more provocative examples. I think the ones I originally proposed were actually quite tame compared to the ones that have actually ended up in the book. Um, so uh, the dream holiday being added, I think that was uh, Alex's suggestion there as to whether or not that would ever be an acceptable reason for a woman to have an abortion. Okay, quite a few people have voted. So we can see there's a, an interesting uh, dynamic going on here around, yes, maybe it is, no, maybe it isn't, particularly around um, wanting to go on holiday, perhaps not being seen as, as so legitimate. Um, the sex of the fetus also, there's, there's a bit more kind of doubt there. Um, not wanting to attend her own wedding while she's pregnant also similarly. I I'm always interested in that one is if you don't think it's okay for her to attend her own wedding, what about if she's attending somebody else's? Then does that change the situation? So the reason why we've pulled together these sorts of activities and we're, we're asking the readers of the book and yourself here to have a think about when and why it would be acceptable for a woman to have uh, a, an abortion in these situations is because we really want to try and get people to have a think about what is it about abortion that makes it acceptable or not acceptable? What are the factors that are important here? So one of the things we do after this activity is we ask the reader to have a think about, okay, does the acceptability of the abortion change if we talk about the gestational stage of the pregnancy? So if the woman is only um, six weeks pregnant, does that mean it is a more legitimate uh, form of abortion for her to have for any of these reasons? Similarly, what if she's at the other end of the pregnancy? What if she's 30 weeks, 35 weeks pregnant? Does that then change the nature of the acceptability of it? Similarly, what about her personal characteristics? If she's married and in a stable relationship, does that mean that her right and her legitimacy of having an abortion is somehow limited? What if she was raped? Would that, would her um, desire to have an abortion somehow have changed because she experienced sexual violence in becoming pregnant? So we want you to consider why do women's rights to have choice and control over their own body and over what happens to their body change in terms of the gestational stage of the human that is within her, so the fetus that is within her? Why does that change whether or not it is legitimate? Similarly, why does it change? Why does she have to justify her behavior? I think that's probably a question to ask. You know, what, what if, why, why is a woman required to provide you with a reason that she, should, um, she is allowed to control her own body and decide what happens to it? One of the questions we pose is surely the right to self-determination and bodily autonomy exists regardless of other people's morality. So it should exist regardless of how she became pregnant, regardless of how old she is, regardless of the reason that she wants to have an abortion. And arguably also regardless of the gestational age of the fetus. Why does her right to control her own body change with the development of that human being who is occupying her body? Let's be honest, it's inside her. She potentially didn't ask for it. Why is that making a difference? So in terms of the law in Britain then, uh, the, all of the answers, that, or all of the questions that we have put down here, except for um, the question around mental health, all of those would not be considered to be legal and legitimate reasons for a woman to have an abortion here in England and Wales. So in England and Wales, it is a crime to procure a miscarriage at any stage in gestation, unless you have permission from a doctor and the doctor agrees to carry out that performance of uh, the, uh, the abortion. So mental health reasons are one of the reasons that are put in place for um, a, a legitimate reason for a woman to have an abortion, her mental and physical health being an element. And um, the other um, aspect that uh, is there is whether or not the fetus has abnormalities. 
There's also a, a stage limit that's put in place. So a woman in this country, is very, it's very difficult for her to have an abortion after she's 24 weeks pregnant, uh, unless there are fetal abnormalities or her life is in, in incredibly grave danger. So just thinking about how the law operates and the law works here, the law does not recognize the notion that a woman has any right to control her own body and control what happens to her body. She has no right to an abortion. She only has the ability to ask a doctor who can decide within the parameters of the law whether or not he, and let's be honest, most doctors are men, whether or not he thinks that she has met the criteria for wanting an abortion. Um, if women gain uh, obtain an abortion outside of those legal provisions, then um, she could potentially face up to life imprisonment for um, having an illegal abortion. That's mad. Sorry, I just <laughs> I just come back from that. I was like, can't believe it. That's still actually the law. Okay, so. Uh, after that sobering fact, uh, we're going to swiftly move on to another way in which heteronormativity strikes and is indeed exploited by the state uh, to intervene upon its subjects. So uh, one of the uh, case studies that we focused on was uh, undercover police love. Um, so the way in which uh, as part of undercover policing tactics, uh, heteronormative, romantic, and sexual scripts have been used to infiltrate protest groups, primarily uh, environmentalist uh, target groups. And this has been a practice that uh, has been adopted by the Metropolitan Police for a few decades, actually. Uh, so, um, yeah, basically, this tradition was started by the Special Demonstration Squad which was a unit of the Met in 1968. And um, an investigative journalist who was doing quite a lot of work on this uh, SDS um, squad, um, basically said that their unofficial motto was by any means necessary. Now, much more recently, I think it was around 2010, 2011, uh, another unit of the Metropolitan Police, it was essentially like a reincarnation of the Special Demonstration Squad called the National Public Order Intelligence Unit. Uh, well, this unit came under fire after revelations that some officers had spent many, many years undercover. I think it was up to seven. In, in one case, it was even nine years. And this was um, basically infiltrating groups, uh, primarily environmentalist groups, uh, establishing friendships, but also sexual and romantic relationships with some uh, members, primarily women members. So in response to this tactic, um, uh, some women said that they were raped by the state. So this was uh, expressed, I think, um, quite well by um, the work of Michael Lodenthal, who in 2014 argued that this invasion of spaces presumed to be beyond state surveillance, the activists' bedrooms, represents a way for the state power to enter the private domain. So perhaps then it's no surprise that many of the women targets spoke about a conspiracy to rape coordinated rape by the police, and even, as I said, being raped by the state. So yeah, what do we think about this, team? Uh, there's some mm, lots of stuff going on here. Um, so we talk about this, I should say, in the context of uh, dealing with institutions and maybe cultures of abuse within institutions. So that's kind of the backdrop to this case. Stacey. Yeah, so uh, this case made me think back to the Victorian era and the Contagious Disease Acts, which were passed um, to control the spread of venereal diseases in the army and navy. Um, the acts, which were considered as a form of state regulation of prostitution, involved the genital examination of prostitutes. And this speculum examination was considered voyeuristic and degrading. And the Ladies National Association denounced this examination as a surgical outrage. They described it as the espionage of enslaved wombs. 
And the process um, was referred to as the instrumental rape of women by the state. So yeah, it just made me think of that and how depressing it is that we are still using this term um, of, yeah, rape, women are being raped by the state. Yeah, and I think even more troubling about this case is when you look at what the Court of Appeal ruled when they were asked to consider whether or not actual rape had taken place. So uh, one of the women, Monica, um, applied to um, have, or essentially applied to the courts to um, rectify the situation because the CPS had refused to prosecute the man who she had had sex with the undercover police officer. And uh, the Court of Appeal ruled that she had not in fact been raped, that her consent was not considered invalid because this, this the information about his identity um, was not, again, very close to this physical performance of the sexual activity. It was considered part of the wider context of her engagement with him. So it therefore wasn't considered to, to be rape. She, she understood that she was having sex with him, they argued, and therefore it wasn't about her lack of knowledge of what the sex entailed which obviously doesn't reflect the experience of Monica. So that's that's not her real name. That was a name that she was given. It doesn't um, reflect the experience of Monica or any of these other women who very much feel like they were actively deceived and they would not have had sex with these men if they had known who they truly were. I think that that really resonates with this discussion we've just already had around consent and the importance of information um, when it comes to what kind of information counts as being sufficient information for consent to be there. So I think it's really, um, it demonstrates, I think it demonstrates, this case demonstrates the institutionalization of misogyny. In fact, the way in which um, by any means necessary means that the women who are, um, with whom the men, the male police officers enter into um, sexual relationships with, have children with, um, become dehumanized almost and objectified through the everyday run of, 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 what, of what might be considered just police business. And so um, I think for that reason, this case, um, like lots of the things that we talk about in that book, uh, this book, um, it has, it, 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 it resonates, it has echoes in lots of the different areas that we are, um, that, that we that um, that we address. So yeah, I definitely I think that one of the, one of these things is certainly turns around the almost idealistic reading of what consent might look like from the um, criminal justice system in that response, Emma. Yes, yeah, sorry, I just forgot to say actually that there was a <clears throat> that uh, one of the relationship resulted in a, a baby being born, and the, the baby is now twenty six years old or something, and they've mounted a case uh, against the the Met, um, and I'm actually yet to I, I I haven't checked recently, but I yeah be curious to see what the outcome is because as Emma was saying, uh, Monica's case. Uh, was, uh, you, know, you, you know, she had a ruling against her case of, uh, um, uh, around consent. Um, yeah, so it's um, really sobering stuff. But um, we also talk about other uh, really interesting uh, forms of and um, institutional cultures of abuse within other institutions, like, for example, the Catholic Church, uh, the media and the military. So, uh, you know, you, there is more of that stuff where this came from. Uh, and yeah, uh, I'm just going to um, pass on to Stacey now. Thanks, Julia. So in chapter 14 of the book, a section that we have called Future Sex, each of us share our vision for the future. I'm going to share my vision for the future with you now. It is based on a statement made by radical feminist Kathleen Barry. So just a bit of background, and this picks up on something that Emma said earlier. Radical feminists believe that heterosexual sex is forced sex and that rape is an expression of hegemonic masculinity. While some feminists argue that the line between consensual sex and for forced sex is thin, radical feminists challenge the existence of this line in the first place. So in 1995, Barry stated, sex is power over all women. Sexuality is used worldwide to dominate and oppress women. So this is how I begin my undergraduate course, Women, Power, Crime and Justice. I ask students what they think of this statement. At the end of the course, I ask students whether or not they have revised their view of Barry's statement. 
So on this module, we look both at women's victimization, but also women as perpetrators of um, violence and sexual violence. So at the end of the module, most students agree with the notion that sex is power and that it is used to dominate and oppress, but they disagree, however, that one, this only happens to women, and two, that this happens to all women. So in our discussions uh, about this quote, we agree that in its current form, it is essentialist. So it assumes that all women are always and already victims. It is reductive. It excludes a number of other groups, for example, uh, men, transgender women and men, those who identify as non-binary, and it homogenizes the experiences of women. So it assumes that all women share the same experiences of sexuality thereby uh, precluding an intersectional analysis of women's uh, experiences of sex and sexuality. Interestingly, this quote also assumes that sex and sexuality are always negative uh, experiences for women. So, based on my discussions with um, students, I offer a intersectional reformulation of the quote by Barry. So we could have that, please. So this is how we've reformulated the quote. And then uh, I'd like you to kind of uh, vote. Uh, oh, I think, yeah, you've got some responses at the bottom of this slide, uh, what you think about this reformulation. So sex in some contexts is power over some women and trans women, as well as some men and trans men. Sexual sexuality can be, but is not always used worldwide to dominate and oppress some women and trans women, as well as some men and trans men. This intersects with other interlocking oppressions such as class, race, ethnicity, and disability disabilities to inform individual experiences. So you can um, let us know what you think of this reformulation um, by choosing yeah, one of the responses below. And if anyone's got any questions or comments they'd like to add, I think we'll have some time at the end to return to this uh, reformulation, but I'd be really interested to hear people's views and see what, how other well people may um, revise that quote by Barry. But I think in the main, people are agreeing and liking. We've got some questions. Just give it a few seconds to let people, and then. Um, as I say, hopefully we'll have some time at the end to unpack this in a bit more detail. Okay. So, I can see some comments in the chat. It's like teaching, you're trying to do three things at once. Okay, I think most people have responded to that, um, but we will return to it if people want to add um, some comments and we can think about those question marks that people have uh, used. So 15 chapters is quite a lot to cover uh, in the time that we've got. So what we've done is we've shared some of the other themes of the book uh, through a Wordle, which we're going to share with you now. So, um, yeah, hi everyone. Um, just, I'm gonna go off script quickly here. Um, if you have got Menti on, on your device, do feel free just to tap on open Q&A and, and type some, not just questions, thoughts, observations, whatever you like, that they're coming through. We've got a few questions um, already about the uh, Gail Newland case. Uh, we'll return to that, I think, in the next slide. Uh, likewise, in relation to um, Emma's research as well, there are kind of a few kind of uh, questions, observations coming through about that. So if you've been provoked by any of the activities um, so far, you know, let us know. Um, have a go on the, the open the Q&A and send, send some of those questions through and we'll, we'll come to those um, in the next slide. Um, but just to, to come to the Wordle itself, this um, was created from uh, putting the entire document of the book um, into a word art generator and we got uh, this particular image. Now it's in the shape of a flower and uh, there's a reason for that. And for that, I'm gonna throw back over to, to Alex. Yeah, so um, uh, thanks. Uh, Michael made this 
these wonderful graphics for us. Um, and the whole thing, in fact, the presentation was made by Michael. So good job, well done, thank you. But what we like, what particularly is noticeable, or like what, what I love about the fact that this last one is in the shape of flower, is that it evokes the cover of the book. There you go. I can see this being sucked into my background. You can't see it, but you get the idea. And the front cover of the book is a picture of a pansy and the pansy is planted under a very urban space. Um, and we um, decided to um, uh, pay um, respect to the work of the artist, Paul Harfleet, who um, uh, does this um, kind of, um, uh, who does this um, anti-homophobic art project and so on the front cover of our book, we've got the uh, Brooklyn Bridge with a pansy uh, planted just beneath it. And what Halfleet does is plant pansies as part of the pansy project in, in, in sites where homophobic abuse has happened. So that's what we've decided to kind of honour with this book to kind of also draw attention to some of us in the writing team's absolute obsession with space, Michael and me. <laughs> and hello again. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and that that's a neat segue into some of the themes that we haven't had the time to, to explore in uh, this evening's session. So just to reiterate what um, kind of Alex said kind of uh, uh, in the opening, uh, the book itself uh, consists of about like, four parts. We look at kind of encountering sex and crime, their state sex and crime, sex, cultures and crime and future sex as well. And so within that, we've we've heard from um, the con contributors uh, this evening about kind of ideas of kind of pregnancy, consent, um, but some of the things that you'll find in the book that have equally kind of like provocative, thought provoking, challenging activities and thought exercises attached to them uh, involve kind of time and space, um, space, the good stuff, um, sexual exploitation, uh, sex and war, um, pleasure and risk, digital sex. I mean, a lot of this um, is drawn from the contributors, contributors um, own research as well. And just to come back to the, the one of the final sections. So just before you get into the kind of like the praxis and like how you're going to change your life, there is that um, the section that I think Alex mentioned earlier on, where we offer our own uh, ideas of, of the future of sex and crime. And uh, for that, uh, well, as a slight teaser, um, if you if you get hold of the book and remember there is a discount code available and we'll flash that up again at the end of the session. Um, if you if you do get hold of the book, you'll find out about my um, troubling relationship with my Alexa enabled uh, speaker. And I'm just going to leave it at that and move over to the Q&A. So, um, as I say, we've got some some questions coming through. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flag some of them up on, on the screen as they come through and throw them out to, to some of my colleagues um, on the panel. So Alex, perhaps you might want to kind of respond to this one. This one came in when we were talking about um, uh, Gail and Chloe. So perhaps you might have some thoughts on this. Uh, yeah, I absolutely think that this is um, an absolutely significant part of the story that isn't, that isn't recognized by the criminal justice system's response to that case. Um, it's not the only case of its kind. So um, women and men have both pretended to be um, women and men uh, in order to seduce people into a same sex liaison. Um, and so it's something which is more common than perhaps we think it is. But I actually think that it, uh, the cases which have um, received the most attention are ones which, which um, have young people in them. So people like who are under the age of 20, 25. And, you know, so you can argue that Gail Newton might be among those because when they are, you know, these people met as, at, uni as, at university as students, you know, you're still trying to find yourself in your, in your world. And it, um, including, you know, the encounter or, with um, uh, non-heterosexual sexualities, perhaps a trans identity, in um, a context where there isn't the, the there hasn't been the vocabulary or the knowledge around those um, different ways of being, and that's why I think that the points that we made that um, that, that uh, were made when we were discussing it are really salient, and you know part of the reason why one of the things that we come back to over and over again when we're talking about this stuff in any of these contexts in the book is it comes down to education and thinking and knowing. So. Um, 
I'm not convinced that if this case was to um, was to enter the courts now, that the outcome would be the same because I do think that the um, the um, over the complete sidestepping of the trans question or the potentiality of the trans question in means that it, there hasn't been proper attention given to the, f the, 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 the full complexity of the case. And I, as you see, as we can see also in the stuff that, in the cases that Emma also talked to us about, um, you know, and Julia, there's some very, um, that the consent comes when there's full information or rather well, if there's not full information, there's no consent. So you can argue here that here that there's not full, full, full information, therefore not consent. But um, that doesn't, that doesn't um that isn't mirrored in other uh, non-consensual um scenarios and so i absolutely agree that this is not necessarily that different and it poses real problems for people advocating for trans rights okay thank you um i was wondering um emma if you you might want to respond to this one maybe Oh, um, my body, my choice feels like a nice, simple response. Um, we don't require men to justify what they do with their body. So why on earth would we require women to do it? We constantly do require women to do it. Um, but it is a human being that has invaded her body. Uh, I think she should have the right all the way through to, uh, to spontaneous labor, I will say. I'm that sort of a feminist to be able to say nope get out my body it's my body i have the right to control it thank you um uh, i don't know i think there, there might be some some other kind of questions maybe kind of on the, the zoom q a but um I'll, I'll roll through these um and then kind of maybe uh, head over to those uh so i think we've addressed that one um again i think i mean i'll open this up to to the panel but i mean maybe alex do you want to lead on this one and then the rest of us can chip in oh, julia do you want to we wrote this chapter together i know that julia is, is sympathetic to the bds members <laughs> well i mean is, is, is it socially acceptable probably not should it be socially acceptable absolutely <laughs> that's basically what i'm going to say about it in short I would say that um, actually BDSM is has become more socially socially acceptable with things like the much more mainstream presence of BDSM imagery um, in um, popular culture. So I'm obviously thinking about Fifty Shades here, but um, what I think the, what whether or not that is real BDSM is a matter for another day, or perhaps for the reading of that chapter in which I say no, it's not. So yeah, I'd say that. Um, it is has become increasingly socially acceptable and there are lots of reasons why bdsm defenses are tr uh, tried to use are used in court to kind of claim that women who suffer se from sexual violence in a sexual encounter have somehow um uh, uh solicited that violence through like a normalization of bdsm from one frame through one framework but it's not like it's not um bdsm as bdsm is so i would say it has become socially acceptable, but with problems. Let's let's also say that the mainstream version of it, or the like represented fictionalized version of it, is very misunderstood. It's very it misunderstood in the sense that it doesn't necessarily get to the core of, I think, what BDSM is is all about. And but I was just saying, like I, I thought um, the season two of Bonding does quite a good job. <laughs> so I just recommended that to the audience. They haven't seen it. <laughs> What's what? Sorry, what's bonding? Oh, it's a Netflix um, series. It's like uh, kind of like quite comedic, quite short episodes. Uh, the first season came out. Um, they got some criticism from the BDSM community, and they really tried to address it in the second season. And I personally think they do quite a good job uh, in the second season. So yeah. So if you if you don't want to buy the book, you can watch one. <laughs> <laughs> No, <laughs> not the same. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, just to, just to say, I know uh, quite a few people looking like sending through their questions. Um, if there are overlaps with some of the questions that have already been asked, um, I'm going to kind of 
maybe kind of hold those to one side so we can have like have some uh, have some quite some fresh topics coming through. Um, so just to say, if like if your question doesn't doesn't come through or your observation doesn't come through, like that's the reason why. Um, oh, that's weird. Oh, that's interesting. See, we've got like a moderation on this, and it would seem that sex is a profane term according to Mentimeter, which I think is perfect for this. So I'm going to read out the comment, and the comment is, sex is historically power over women. You might have noticed, very, very quickly, you might have noticed that come up on the word earlier. Um, that's, that's what kind of comes up. Um, so presumably people were putting in maybe kind of like sex or sex related terms, but according to Mentimeter, uh, that can't get through the profanity uh, filter. Uh, so I'm going to say that that one's answered for the moment. Uh, what do we think of uh, this one? We do touch on it. Um, unfortunately, one of, so one of the things that was so hard about this book was working out what to put in it. Uh, and we had these kind of grand ambitions. And then as we started writing, we were like, yeah, yeah, chapters will only be like five, five, 6,000 words. And then as we started unpacking issues, we were like, okay, no, this, this is actually gonna involve more. So some of the issues in there, we can't go into a huge amount of detail, but certainly one of the things uh, we talk about in relation to um, consent is we briefly talk about age, um, but we also talk about uh, the fact that in some states in America, it is still legal for uh, men to have sex with children, like let's be honest, they're children, uh, if they're married. So Alex, I can't remember, do you remember off the top of your head what the youngest age was? I think it was like 11. It was horrendously young, but it's fine because they're married. So uh, that that's that's yeah, perfectly acceptable. Years old with the husbands. Yeah. So not in a huge amount of detail, but we certainly do comment on it. This is where it would be helpful if I had the name um, to hand. But did anybody see? There's a particular kind of like case in the moment at the moment to do with a, a French author. Um, I think there was a, a story in the New York Times about two years ago, but it, it's, it's revisited in a, a story in The Guardian today. If you kind of go to the culture section, um, this, there's, there's a, a kind of a related story there. Um, again, would have been helpful if I had the name to hand. So if we um, head back to this. Yeah, again, so I'm going to read out because it's got the word sex in it. Um, so thinking about the beginning bit of the presentation, the more conventionally deviant types of sex show, sex show how closed minded the general public still is, and it perpetuates stigmatization of pleasure. Um, does anybody want to maybe kind of comment on the idea of the, the stigmatization of pleasure, particularly in relation to the maybe kind of like pleasure and risk, that particular chapter? Yeah. <laughs> um... So we talk about how um, pleasure is always stigmatized in any form um, throughout sort of like throughout history, and particularly when it's associated with risky practices around sexuality, but also drug taking. And here I'm particularly referring to the phenomenon of chemsex, which is basically having sex on drugs. Um, and I think for me, what's interesting is that too much pleasure is pathologized uh, in different ways. And obviously in this case, particularly because it's around homosexual group sex, maybe on drugs. So it's not good for you, it's not healthy and so on. So it's pathologized and intervened upon by uh, public health authorities, as well as sometimes the criminal justice system. Uh, conversely, though, uh, when we think about other risky activities, for example, uh, the extreme sports, uh, those are not pathologized and inter intervened upon to the same extent and in the same way, even though they can be potentially very risky and deadly and, and so on. So, you know, it de basically depends who's doing it and for what purpose and, you know, to what extent. Uh, you know, the, the pleasure that you get is, uh, you know, acceptable and, and indeed, uh, you know, extreme sports tend to be, tends to be the stuff of uh, usually males, 
um, most of them white. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not saying that there is a, you know, but there is a thing there. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm gonna say about that. I don't know if Alex wants to add. No, I think that you've, you've, you've hit the nail on the head, particularly around the, uh, um, the way in which particular forms of pleasure become demonized or rather, you know, it's exactly what we talked about at the beginning that, you know, um, pleasure doesn't take a pla doesn't have a place in the in the um, uh, in, in the originary mainstream ideas around sexuality, and I think that that is something that um, perhaps is shifting, and certainly it's from the responses we had this evening, perhaps is shifting in in terms of, of the contemporary imaginary. So yeah, absolutely. Just something to add to that. So one of the things that I learned from writing this book, which I was really shocked when I found this out. So when um, homosexual anal sex was partially decriminalized in 1967, the, there was a discussion in parliament of should they decriminalize heterosexual anal sex? So the Buggery Act was still in force. So Buggery Act dates back to 1533. Uh, and the discussion in Parliament was essentially, oh no, we definitely shouldn't decriminalize that because we don't want men doing that to their wives. Uh, and it wasn't until 1994 that anal sex between men and women was eventually decriminalized. So just again, going back to this idea of, of um, it's socially acceptable sex that is um, allowed and prohibited or not prohibited by the criminal justice system and by the law. Fantastic, thank you. Um, just to kind of like quickly flag it up, the, the book I was referring to earlier was uh, the appropriately named uh, Consent by uh, Vanessa Springora, and there's a review of that in today's Guardian. So if tonight you're going to buy two books, uh, make ours the first one, and then maybe have a think about that one. Uh, we've got time for a kind of couple more questions, I think. Um, I think a bit more of a kind of an observation here. Um, so be very interesting to see what the sentencing would be on an identical set of facts, but with two men or man and a woman without any penile penetration. So uh, I think another kind of comment coming through from a uh, kind of a teaching colleague. Um, so I think, yeah, perhaps what harm does bigamy do? I don't know, I, should I throw that one out to, to the panel? Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> they voted to make adultery illegal as well and thought marriage was about love. Sheesh indeed. I mean. <laughs> yeah, perhaps yeah. I should have put the emphasis on what harm do, does bigamy do in a, in a slightly, should have, <laughs> I'll leave it to be. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's why we have, it, when we were creating the book, we tried to start off from kind of big ideas like, that monogamy, bigamy. No, we don't really talk about bigamy because I kind of think of that as a different thing to the opposite of monogamy. And we talk about um, uh, different, how to think about something which you've always thought about in one way, in a different way. Um, and so that's why we, I think that it, one of the things we try to achieve is to um, challenge these sorts of, um, I guess, orthodoxies that people may come into the classroom with and people yeah of course if you're teaching first year then that may be what um the sorts of things that they may say but actually unpacking a bit what it would mean to make adultery illegal and you know to unpack what it is that, uh, what what the function that marriage has and lots of the stuff that emma's written in the chapter around consent is and um, virginity particularly is really important regarding like actually what marriage really is has historically been um, and so, yeah, I think that this is a really good point, but it also is exactly the sort of thing that in our work, we will try to um, pr like find the tools to start to, um, to drill down into. Just to jump in there as well, what's interesting about this is this kind of about marriage, about love. And one of the things that I teach on my module is about wife rape and it's really interesting to see students in their third years and their how their views change about these things and certainly their responses to kind of uh, rape within the institution of marriage and yeah how they start to kind of criticize and unpack that institution so yeah it's really interesting to see that difference in you know how they think over the, over the three years 
Yeah, just uh, Vivian saying there that we should have a, an adulterous list, which is slightly horrifying. I, I, it's up, so something we haven't really talked about tonight, but definitely kind of also runs through the book is the extent to which all sexual relationships take place within a capitalist society. So we are, we're writing, we're highlighting the extent to which capitalism very much kind of comes in to how sexual relationships are framed. And just um, feeding on from what Alex has said, marriage in itself has, has it was, it's traditionally always been about property. It's about securing and tying together property. And yet this, the heteronormative world we live in now, it's all about romance. It's not, it's about property guys. Like don't tie yourself into an institution that's about property. And bigamy, the, the, the crime of bigamy, again, it's not about breaking romance. It's about, um, daring to have more than one legal contract that has your property tied up with another person. Oh, Julia. No, sorry. I just, I was just, I just noted that there was a question in the Q and A as well, but I thought maybe we should prioritize the ones that uh, were in the menti first because I don't, I'm lost with the order of things. No, no, no. Do, do you want to do you want to go to to that one, and then we've yeah. got one final one on on the mentee, and then I was, uh, I was I was kind of burning to like address it actually. Um, it's a question from Catherine who says all laws around sex and all other laws have been drafted and voted on by a majority male parliament. I wonder if the panelists think a majority female parliament would amend or pass different laws. I think it's a good question. I mean, maybe something to start with is the 2003 Sexual Offences Act, which is by no means, it's not perfect in any way, shape or form. There are massive problems with it, but it's the first time that uh, consent was formally, like actively written into the law. Prior to that, it, it, the, the law had focused around force in particular. And one of the other key changes was that the defendant's belief of consent had to be reasonable. So before the 2003 Act, if the defendant had a belief of consent that was completely unreasonable, it was still considered that his belief of the consent being there uh, was, was okay, it was, it was fine, because he, he had a, it, it was unreasonable of him to believe that, but he nevertheless had a true belief, which is obviously a horrendous situation um, and came about because of a criminal case called Morgan, where a man told three other men that they could go and have sex with his wife and don't worry about it, she'll scream, but that's because she just likes her sex kinky. So you go ahead and you have sex with her. And they claimed that they had a reasonable, but uh, they had an unreasonable but true belief of her consent. And as a consequence of that case, the law changed. So 2003, obviously we don't have um, a predominantly female parliament, but more women were in Parliament in 2003, and we did see this this change in law. So maybe. Yeah, I'm just like, you know, there, there's a, there's a risk there of like, there is essentialism and there is heteronormativity. And for me, like those two powers are so strong. I'm a bit of a Marxist, so just in case you didn't know. And um, so to me, it's like these two powers are so strong. They're just like people can't liberate their ideas from them and therefore like you know in a sense even if women you know more women were in parliament maybe like the types of problems that would be discussed would change but not necessarily we wouldn't necessarily like break free of these kind of structures that um that kind of determine the, the, the horizon or the you know the boundaries of what is acceptable and, and not and so on and I think you know and 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 perhaps you know then there is another question of representation not just men and women but also you know, the full spectrum of the rainbow, or the full, you know, all the colors of the rainbow in the sense of like having much more, you know, much more representative and maybe horizontal kind of policy making or whatever, that would be nice, yeah. <laughs> and that's it, that's what I have to say. Uh, yeah, so I'm sorry, but I think with a, an eye to the time, uh, I think we might have to kind of like move to the, to the final bit. Um, so thank you so much for, for your questions. I'm sorry, there, there were a number of really, really good ones that kind of like came in, but uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know, drop us an email. I don't know, read the book. <laughs> and speaking of which, um, yeah, I'm gonna hand back over to, to Alex um, to wrap things up maybe. Oh, okay, great. So uh, yeah, so this is the book. We, um, 
we like it a lot. We hope that you do too. Um, if we've tempted you to have a look at it, then this is the link that takes you to where you can get it. And there's 30% off. So of course, like involve yourself in that if you want to. Um, we are the, um, this is part of the Gender Deviance and Society Research Group at the University of Greenwich. And so we um, routinely do these sorts of things. So if you're interested in like coming to some of our other stuff later on in the year, maybe one day in a face-to-face -face scenario where you don't have to bring your own wine, but you can drink the university's wine, then uh, we'll be able to uh, <laughs> say, we'll be able to, um, to, to <laughs> organize that. But otherwise, thank you guys so much for coming and thank you so much for your really probing and, and uh, serious engagement with the stuff that we were doing. We hope that you had a great night and uh, look forward to hanging out in some other way, in some other time, sometimes. So I invite the rest of the panelists to also do their vocal goodbyes. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for coming.